Welcome to Keep the Game Beautiful podcast. Each week, I highlight incredible people who are doing amazing things in soccer, the beautiful game. I'm Anna Turi, your host. Thank you for listening. In one week, it will be the start of Convention 2021. Last year, I had so much fun at convention. I made so many great new connections, and I learned a lot. It was such a high point for the podcast for me. And I was very excited for it, for convention this year. Of course, it is looking very different. And it is kind of a letdown, but there's still so many opportunities to be taken because of it being online. So I wanted to give you a quick forecast of what convention will look like for Keep the Game Beautiful this year. Every day, I will be hosting about two to three short webinars. They'll be about 15 minutes, basic information, just some conversation happening, and there will hopefully be a Q&A option as well. So I really hope if you're attending convention, you'll be able to listen in and participate as well. Also, if you aren't able to participate, then I we will be posting a few of the webinars onto the podcast later on. Today with Sue, we talk about her family connections and how big her family was in the game. Uh, we talk about her and her siblings coaching together, and how she first got into coaching because of her family. I know if me and my brother were coaching together, it would not turn out well at all. So that was such a fun dynamic to learn about. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. Today's guest is Sue Moynihan. Sue and her family have been involved in the game for a very long time, and she grew up playing. After college, she began coaching collegiately, even coaching her own sister. Now she is the marketer for her family business, Keeper Goals. Sue is also a a founding board member of the Wisconsin Women's Soccer Advisory Council. So, Sue, I'm wondering if you'd like to add anything else or talk about what got you to where you are today. (laughs) Well, I think you covered a lot, the highlights. Yeah, Um, I guess the only thing I'd really add maybe is I spent 17 or 18 years coaching college. Um, and decided to give it up probably about 10 years ago. So that was a major decision in my life. So on this podcast, I always start with the same three questions. First, what does the beautiful game mean to you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, First, thanks for having me on this, Anna. I really love what you do with this podcast. I think it's great and I'm thrilled to be included. Um, The beautiful game to me, I guess as a sort of in, in two arenas of my life, like as a player, coach, and now a fan, the game, I think it's beautiful because it allows for creativity and kind of endless creativity. And I love that about it. And I love that it's a constant challenge. Like the more you add to your game, uh, physically, tactically, technically, or um, sort of in terms of mental toughness or whatever you want to call that physical, that um, psychological aspect, the more you add to that, the more opportunity you have to be creative. And I think that it's, there's really nothing else like it that I know. Um, so I love that about it. And then as a, just as a person, the game's been a huge way for me to connect with people throughout my life that, you know, love something that I love. Um, my family was all involved. You know, my husband is a coach, um, many, 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 many good friends over the years and colleagues. So that that's probably the, the most important aspect of the game for me and why I think it's such a beautiful thing. What are actions or things you do to keep the game beautiful? Hmm. I guess right now I just try to watch and learn um, as much, well, as much as I can, um, certainly be a fan cheer on my husband's team, my brother, my brother coaches um, at Northwestern, cheer on their teams um, and just try to stay engaged that way. Uh, The work that we do with the women's, the Wisconsin Women's Soccer Advisory Council is real important to me. And I I think that's an important contribution just in helping um, female coaches kind of find a place to get support, to learn, to be encouraged. Those are probably the top things. 
How do you encourage others to keep the game beautiful? I got probably mostly through the Wisconsin Women's Soccer Council. Um, and then just there's a lot of players that I've coached over the years that are now involved in coaching. So I, I try to do the best I can to um, cheer them on, support them, stay in touch, give them encouragement, answer questions, that type of thing. So I want to start off, what is it like growing in a, up in a family where they all love the game so much? <laughs> um, it was an experience for sure. I, I have to say when I, when I was really young, I started playing, I think when I was nine and I started because my brothers played, they started the year before, and that was kind of the beginning of soccer in our part of Milwaukee. Um, and I did not want to play. I wanted to play baseball. And my mom and dad just kind of said, oh, no, <laughs> you're going to try this. So I was on a boys team with my brother, Mike, for the first year. And um, somehow I, I grew to love the game in that environment. They were, it was, you know, they were, it was a good team. They were competitive and they, um, they kind of encouraged me. And there was another girl on the team as well. Her name was Chris. So, you know, I had an ally. Um, and really from then on, like if everyone in our house and in our neighborhood was playing soccer, we'd go outside, you know, to play and everybody would play soccer or we'd practice juggling in the backyard, that type of thing. So it was a lot of fun. Was there ever any stress or did you ever compare yourself to your siblings? <laughs> yeah, always. <laughs> especially my two. So I'm the oldest and then I have a brother, Mike, who is one year younger and another brother, John, who's a, a, two years younger than me. Um, and then a sister who's five years younger. So, and she, she didn't um, enter into our competitions as much just because she was younger. Um, but, and my brothers were, were both really good players um, even, even when they were young. So quite honestly, I could not, there was really I don't think any aspect of the game that I could beat them in <laughs> um, ever. So, but I still tried and I, I think I've learned a lot from, uh, from playing with them. And I would, I mean, I would go practice with my brother's teams all the time. Um, and that when I was young, that wasn't stressful as I got, you know, maybe like 12, 13, that became, it became less fun and a little more stressful. Just, you know, as you can imagine, there was, um, it was just a little harder being the only girl playing with a bunch of boys. Um, so I kind of stopped that probably around 15. Um, and then by then there were girls teams, you know, to play on. So that was, that was a little bit better for me at that age. Going off of you always trying, how have you seen that mindset develop into where you are now about always trying and always going? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I guess, yeah, I guess that's sort of what I've always done. Even I've been throughout my coaching career and my, what I do now, I've, I've kind of, I guess maybe gotten in over my head a little bit at the beginning. Like when I started college coaching, I had literally zero experience at the college level. I'd coached a high school girls JV team for like two seasons. And that was the extent of my coaching. So I didn't, I mean, <laughs> I didn't know what, what to do first, but I just decided, you know what, I'm going to do the best I can with this and um, try as hard as I can. And over years that, that kind of paid off and helped, um, it allowed me to be successful. And it, it was stressful, certainly in the early years. Um, and the same thing when I started at Keeper Goals, I didn't know a whole lot about marketing, but same philosophy applied. I was like, I'll just learn as I go and do the best I can. And 10 years in, I, I think, <laughs> I think I'm finally starting to get the hang of it. So how did your coaching career start? Uh, my coaching career started, well, basically um, my mom, my mom became a coach. Um, she, for my childhood, she was always in charge of a lot of administrative things for our soccer in the state of Wisconsin, um, really doing as much as she could to create opportunities for girls to play. Um, and then when she, when her, she coached uh, one girls club team all the way from when they were 
probably nine or 10 up till when they all went to college. When they all went to college, a bunch of them went to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee to play soccer and their coach um, left the school. So they were hiring a new coach and the girls all went to the administration and said, please, please, can you hire Mrs. Moynihan? Uh, so they did. So she became the coach and about a couple months after she was hired, before their first season started, she was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and I was unable to coach. She was in the hospital from, she coached the first game and then she was in the hospital the rest of the season. So I moved back home and helped out with whatever I could help with. And one of the things I helped with was coaching that team. Um, they had an interim head coach at the time who had been a player on the men's team. Uh, so my brother and I helped him with the team that year. Um, and then when she passed away, they asked me to stay on and be the head coach. And of course I said, yes, cause she had asked me to do, she said, can you please take care of my girls? And um, I agree, you know, I told her, yeah, I'll, I'll do it at least for a year. So that's sort of what I signed up for. I thought that's what I was committing to. Um, and I wound up staying about, I think five years as head coach there. So it's probably not your typical story um, of getting involved, but it was, it was probably one of the best things I've ever done. At the time, I didn't think so. It was extremely difficult, but uh, looking back, it was, it was a great experience. What was it like coaching players that were only a few years younger than you? That, that I, was a challenge, but they were all, they were great. I mean, they were very um, enthusiastic, encouraging, respectful, you know, all the things you would hope players would be. Uh, probably the circumstances helped with that a little bit because they knew, I mean, it was a difficult situation for them. They just, many of them had lost a coach who was like kind of a second mother to a lot of them, you know, if they'd been on our club team. So that was hard. And they knew it was hard for me as well. So I think it probably got a little bit of grace in those first couple of years, just because of the situation. Um, and there were actually like, there was one girl on the team who I'm still friends with today. She played, I played at the university of Wisconsin Madison and she was on the team there with me. And then she transferred to UWM for her final year. So then I, I was coaching you know, one of my friends that I had played with previously. Um, so that, that was interesting, but I really, I mean, it, it, I don't think it ever caused really a big problem. How valuable was that team environment while everyone was still grieving? Oh, I think it, I mean, I think it was huge. I think it was a great outlet for a lot of them to be able to put their energy into playing a game that they loved. Um, and it was a challenge for them. And they knew they were going to be supported by, you know, their teammates, their coaches, they were around people that understood what they were going through um, and were kind of experiencing the same thing. So I, I think that was super valuable. It might, it might've been a, a little bit hard in retrospect, it, probably for like the girls who hadn't been on her club team or weren't part of that experience and then they're you know on the college team she was their coach for a handful of practices in one game so they didn't you know they weren't as close to her it didn't affect them in the same way and that that was probably if, if I had it to do over again I would probably make a better effort to address that side of it and make sure those you know those girls felt like <laughs> she wasn't the only thing we talked about or you know the only motivation for playing I've never asked any of them about it. And maybe I will if I talk to any of them. But You talk about how difficult this time was. How sh much stress were you under as well? Uh, I probably was under a lot. I, th I mean, at the time, I didn't really recognize it as stress. It was just, you know, this is what it is. And it, and the, it was kind of an, a huge responsibility to take on a team. So it was extremely busy trying to figure out how to do that and, and get the job done. Um, and it, we were, I mean, it was a difficult situation. UWM at that time, they'd only been division one for, I think one or two years. Um, so they, their funding wasn't up to par with a lot of the schools we were playing. The support system there wasn't as developed. 
Um, so in addition to coaching, I had another job um, and we had to do a ton of fundraising um, and I didn't have any paid assistance. Uh, so it was, <laughs> you know, and we we're playing against like University of Wisconsin and Michigan State, like with, you know, huge budgets and developed teams. So uh, it, it was it was just a big challenge. So I, I don't think I really recognized the stress at the time. I just was like, OK, we got to I got to figure this out. And I'm competitive by nature. So I was certainly not happy to lose or, you know, to sit there and think, oh, my gosh, we have this excuse because we're not funded as well as other schools that that didn't even enter my head at the time. It was just, OK, what's next? What's next? So that probably helped. That probably helped me a lot to kind of get through that time um, and be productive in that time. So and, we look at, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. So we look at the NWSL and many women still need to have a second job to support themselves. What mm-hmm. advice would you give to uh-huh. a woman still playing, but also having to work? Oh boy. Yeah, it's a challenge. It really is. I guess the biggest thing I would say to them, I I think do whatever you do with that other time where you're having to make some income, hopefully it's something that you love to do um, and you have a passion about. And I I think there's so many opportunities for women um, that are professional athletes to do some kind of business on their own where they can make some income where it's going to be sustainable over years and years. And I would, I would hope that they look at that as an opportunity to build something for their future and also do something they love while they're playing. Um, And at the same time, it can afford them some flexibility, which they need in that job. So quickly before moving on, I want to ask you about your sibling dynamic. I know if I was (laughs) coaching with my brother, things would not go well. So what was that like? (laughs) Well, interesting. So when I very first started, the brother that helped out with me that first year when, you know, my mom was in the hospital, um, that's my other brother, John, not the one that I coached with for a long time and coaching with John. And then the, the interim head coach was a man named Eddie Miller, who, um, I still talk to today is a great, great guy. So the three of us coached together, that was, that was a different dynamic than coaching with Mike because John and Eddie, I don't think either one of them ever aspired to be a coach. They were just trying to help out. Um, so th- that was a little bit different. Um, well, I shouldn't say didn't aspire to be a coach. John, John coaches and is a very good coach, coaches boys. So, but it wasn't like his um, career ambition. Uh, coaching with my brother, Mike, when we first started, um, <laughs> was, I, it was good because we both had the same, um, goals and we both really wanted the team to win. Uh, it probably took, it took a year or so to kind of get our roles sorted out. Um, but honestly, I think I was so grateful to have his help at that time that I, I was kind of willing to put up with anything I can see. I mean, he's, he was, and is an excellent coach. And I, like I said, in the beginning, I didn't have, I had two years of experience coaching high school JV. So I, I was not equipped and he was, and I could learn a lot from him. Um, and it, we kind of, I mean, for at least the first, well, pretty much the whole time he wound up doing a lot of the coaching and I wound up doing a lot of all the other work that goes along with being a coach and um, a lot of, dealing with the players and so forth. So that probably helped keep, you know, that, that we kind of separated our roles probably helped um, with some of the <laughs> normal squabbling that you might find between siblings. But then as we got older, you know, that it, it was really a great experience coaching with them. Was there any problem when you coached your sister? Cause I kind of coach my brother now and he likes to give me attitude all the time. <laughs> really? <laughs> Maybe I should have my sister talk to him. Um, <laughs> yeah, she didn't. She was great. I mean, she, it's just her personality though, to, to be receptive to what, you know, coaches tell her and stuff. So she, she was really great. And it, I mean, it was, it was nice having her there being, you know, being able to spend some time with her and her friends as well. Sorry, I don't have any good stories about (laughs) about that, but I don't. 
So I want to move on a little bit. Can you talk about Keeper Goals and how the family business started? Oh, sure. Um, well, it actually started as a metal cutting business. So like, just think of a sawmill for metal. Um, and that was, I think, in 1974. My dad and his friend, who's actually my godfather, John Grellinger, started, they just both decided they wanted to run their own business and not be employees of somebody so they quit their jobs. My dad, having four kids under the age of 10, just came home one day and said, I quit. And they started um, this metal cutting business up in the garage, um, which I don't think my mom was thrilled about, but that's what happened. Um, and then they grew that business, um, probably took, I don't know, a year, you know, and then they had a building that they ran it out of and then they bought a building. Um, and then somewhere, probably about four years later, we started playing soccer at our, like a lot of kids in our neighborhood and at our grade school and our grade school wanted to put soccer goals up on the playground. And my dad was like, Oh, well, I could probably, you know, we got metal, we can build some. So his friend, who was an engineer, Dick Bielefeld, um, designed a soccer goal that was going to be safe, you know, so it wouldn't tip over, um, properly designed. Uh, and then my dad built it and th those went up at our grade school. And then not too long after that, the city of Milwaukee was buying a large number of soccer goals for a bunch of parks around the city. And uh, I think they, they approached my dad and asked if he would want to build them. So he did. And that kind of, you know, he, he figured, oh, there's a market for these. And he decided to start selling soccer goals at that time. And he went, you know, kind of around, he go to trade shows and like the soccer coaches convention, which was much smaller at that time than it is now, but he'd go to things like that and park district shows and started selling them. And then probably I, I think around 1983 is when he, he decided he should develop because at that time it was, I think a lot of, you know, people would meet him and they'd say, Oh, we want a goal. We want it to be built this way. We want it, you know, made out of this material and these dimensions. And he would, kind of custom build whatever the people wanted. And then around 83, he decided it was time to have a standard style of goal. And that's when he, he his first goals were, that he did that with were the M83s, which stands for Moynihan 83. And he still, we still make those today. They're um, one of a popular goal that we still sell. What role do you have in keeper goals right now? Right now, I, I well, it, we're still a, a you know family-owned, relatively small business, so everybody wears a lot of hats, um, and you kind of do whatever needs to be done. But my main job is uh, marketing, um, so overseeing the websites um, and creating materials on all the products, which we have many of. Um, doing content marketing, social media. Um, press releases, uh, email, external communication, that all the, all that type of stuff. We just finished. I'm kind of. We just finished a branding project where we um, really took some time to figure out what our brand really is all about. Um, so I'm kind of excited about that. We just finished it, and we're just starting to kind of change over. Like we changed over our color to green and. Uh, change some of the graphics and, and certainly our message. So we're just starting to implement all that. So I'm kind of excited about that. So being a relatively small business, how important was the support you received over COVID times? Oh, um, it, yeah, certainly extremely helpful. Um, although like in our, for us, it, it's interesting during COVID, we really um, haven't seen the effects of it yet. It was, you know, we're pretty consistent with how our business has been the past couple of years, but we would probably anticipate that it will hit us one to two years down the road because most of our, most of our business is done through um, like large contracts. So where the, you know, a city or a university or park district, whatever might decide two years ago, they decided, okay, we're going to build this new indoor facility in 2020 and we're having you do it. 
and the money set aside already. So we're, we're finishing lots of projects that have been in the works for a couple of years. Um, and we would expect some of those budgets of, you know, a lot of those entities will be decreased um, in the next one to two years. So it might affect us a little bit more later on. You had mentioned your dad went to convention, United Soccer <laughs> Coaches Convention for many years. So mm -hmm. I want to ask, how has the past conventions helped you? I'm going to ask about the future in just a little bit, okay. but how have the past yeah. really benefited your business? Oh, yeah, it's a huge show for us, um, just with the number of soccer people there from around the whole country. It's a great time to get to talk to old friends and meet new people um, and just get the word out about Keeper Goals. So it's, you know, we're very grateful for that opportunity. So this year is obviously going to be very different. Mm -hmm. Do you know what will this year's convention look like for you? Yeah, we're still a little bit figuring that out, I guess they've, they're having, um, virtual booths for all the vendors, as you might know, and they're, we're just in the process of setting up all our information on the back end of that right now. Um, so we'll, try, we're going to try to keep our, our information focused. Um, and then we have, you know, our staff, uh, mans the virtual booth um, each day during the convention. They have, like the convention organizers have time set aside. I think it's a couple hours each afternoon where you have to man your virtual booth. So you have to have somebody there to answer questions. And then they suggest that you um, staff the booth the rest of the hours the convention is on, which I think is probably nine to five, Monday through Friday of that week. Um, so I don't, it, it, we'll, we'll see what that all looks like. We haven't really, we've done a few very small virtual conventions, um, but not, not one of this size. So it'll be really interesting to see how this goes. Yeah, I kind of logged in the other week and kind of put in my information, but it was a little confusing and different at first. Was it? Okay. Yeah, oh. we're still, yeah, we've had a few uh, glitches. We're still trying to sort out with the people organizing it. And I imagine, I mean, it's a huge task to take that on and figure it all out in one year with no, like no chance to try it ahead of time. So it, uh, I, I give a lot of credit to the people that are running it. Mm -hmm. One thing I definitely don't like about this year is not getting the big bag of candy. <laughs> well, maybe you'll get a little treat in the mail. <laughs> you can't give out virtual candy, can you, I guess? No, you can't. No, it's no fun. Are you going to do podcasts during that week? Yep. So we're going to set up and I'll be logged on every day. I don't go to school. I go to school for like an hour every day, so oh, it'll okay. be fine. Okay. And I'll just kind of stay on and wait for people to log on maybe just do school while I'm waiting and really it depends I'm just kind of ready to go with the flow because we don't know exactly what's happening yeah so will you will you have like some people set up ahead of time that you know you know you're going to interview yeah I think that's what's going to happen we'll have set up times and then it's open to everyone so people can log on and listen if they want while I'm interviewing okay. someone Oh, cool. That'll be good. Mm -hmm. I'll try to check it out. So moving on just a little bit, I want to ask about the woman, the Wisconsin Women's Soccer Advisory Council. So can you yeah. take a little bit and just talk about that? Oh, sure. Um, it's something I'm really excited about. We've been, gosh, I think I want to, well, we've, it's been about three, three and a half years that we've been in existence, um, and it started, gosh, it, honestly, it started because um, the Wisconsin Soccer Association put out their list of people that were in the Hall of Fame a couple years ago, and it was all men, um, which was pretty common. And then somebody looked into how many men, how many women in the, the Hall of Fame, and I mean, I, I want to say there were maybe eight or nine women and, you know, 300 men, so something to that proportion. Um, so everybody, well, we <laughs> just one, one woman in particular, Jess Taylor kind of kickstarted it all by just uh, voicing her displeasure at that and, you know, saying it needed to change. And uh, Melissa Zelinsky, who's the 
executive director of Wisconsin Soccer agreed and, and kind of kickstarted this organization um, by having a meeting just to hear what people thought, get people's feedback, what can we do? How should, you know, how should we address the overall issue of like women not being supported as well in Wisconsin and in soccer? Um, and this, this grew into the Wisconsin Women's Soccer Advisory Council with, now we have a board of about, I think nine people. There's two men and seven women. Um, and really our first aim was to have kind of large events that could draw women together uh, and men as well that wanted to support them. Um, and then our plan was to, to kind of grow it from there um, and see what kind of other outreach we wanted to have. And our, la our last convention um, or symposium was last February, right before COVID. Like it, I think it was February 28th um, and then COVID hit and, and we've sort of, for the most part, put things on hold um, because we're not able to meet in person and um, not able to really, you know, create meaningful in-person events for people. So, um, we'll, we're starting to get back back at it, but we'll get more going as soon as as soon as we're able. Yeah, I was a little disappointed last year. I wasn't able to make it to the symposium, and I don't remember why right now. But for some you reason, had... I wasn't there. Yeah, I remember you had something else, but I, I can't remember what it was. I remember asking you about it, but hopefully the next one you'll be able to get to. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I'm going to block it out in my calendar. Yeah. Well, I'll let you know as soon as we know the date. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole women, Wisconsin Women's Soccer Advisory Council started because someone voiced their opinion. It, How yep. important and is it in for women to in, voice their opinion and get their feelings out there and what they think needs to change. It's so important. Uh, I mean, it's huge. Even if, even if you're not going to say it perfectly, it's so important for you to get your voice out into the world and let people know what you think. Because you, you just don't know what opinion you have or what thought you have that might really make a big difference for somebody. And yeah, I give, I give Jess a lot of credit because at the time, you know, you, you could easily, you know, somebody could complain about something and you could easily sort of dismiss it and not really think about it, but she just kept plugging away and it, it was great because I think a lot of good has come from that. Before wrapping up, I want to talk just a little bit about the NWSL and knowing that there's a new Kansas City team. Well, I'm, it's a little bittersweet for me because the Kansas City team came from Salt Lake City, which is where I'm living. Um, so we were you know, sad to see them go, but I think Kansas City provides a great environment for them. Um, certainly a super supportive soccer community. Um, and, and the, well, I think it'll be great for that, that city. It'll be interesting for the league as a whole, just to have it um, emerge as, you know, kind of a new team with new owners, new leadership, um, I'll be, I, I'll be really excited to watch them. And I'm excited. One of, uh, Rich's, my husband's players, um, signed with them recently, a goalkeeper, Carly Nelson. So we're going to be a big, huge fan of Kansas city. Yeah. I was just going to ask about Carly actually, but okay. kind of, I'm going to change it into a little bit of a different question. Okay. So as a coach, what is it like to see your players go on to greater things and to move to the next level or to even move on to coach? Oh gosh, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, it's really rewarding. I, it's in both arenas. Like it's super rewarding to see a player go on and be able to continue to play a game they love and make money doing it. I mean, that that's huge um, for any. I think for any coach to see any of their players do that. But by the same token, I think it's it's always really rewarding as a coach to see any of your players go on to be successful at whatever their dream was, whether it be to continue playing, to be a referee, to be a teacher, to be an astronaut, whatever, whatever it was, you always want them to be able to achieve their dreams. And I mean, honestly, for a long time, when I coached in the early years, there was no opportunity. There really wasn't. You, I mean, for a girl to say, well, when I'm done playing, I want to go play pro. Like, 
you would you would almost have to laugh at that because it wasn't it wasn't a thing. Um, so for me, as a young coach, and then seeing some of our players in the probably like right at the end of when I was coaching at UWM, a couple of our players went on and played pro. One of them, Lisa Kraskowski, was on the first. Um, San Diego team and I can't think of what they were called at the time or even what the league maybe it was the WSL at the time um, and I remember when that happened and I just thought oh, this is this is a watershed moment where you know you can actually tell your players that they have that opportunity like that's that's huge it just opens up so many so many avenues for girls um, sorry I think I got a little off track but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a it's a great thing yeah so you look at when you were nine or so you didn't have a girls team to play on and then look at where we are now how do you want the woman or how do you hope to see the women's game continue to grow in the future yeah I would I mean my hope would be in a couple ways one I would hope that the teams that are in existence, the pro teams that are in existence would um, get to a point where they can pay all of the players a, a good wage where they don't have to have a second job like you spoke about. Um, and then from there, I would hope the numbers would grow in the league and there'd be more teams around the country. So more girls would have the opportunity to watch those pro teams. Um, play in different cities around the country. Um, I think that, I think those two things would, would probably do more to kind of help the growth of the youth game than anything else, because um, from a number standpoint, more people be exposed, more girls see that and realize like, Oh, I, that could be me, you know, that could be me out there. Um, and I, I guess at the youth level, I don't know. I, my, my heart at this point for like the youth game is really with like the younger young kids and their development. Um, and I, I hope, I hope as a country, we like maybe put more into that. Cause I think not only in the, the big clubs in the big cities, but in, you know, rural areas or in the inner city and just get more, younger kids involved in the game. How important is it that girls have women coaches? Because I know I actually never had, have never had a woman coach, but mm -hmm. I have such an amazing platform that I have experienced how important and how important like a footprint they have. Yeah. Wow. That's really interesting that you've never had a female coach either. Wouldn't have guessed that. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's, I think it's very important for young girls to, to have um, at least one female coach that they can relate to um, in some way. And ideally that would be their own coach, but if not, maybe, um, you know, somebody at a camp or something that they go to, um, somebody that they can respect. I, 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 I do think that you know, obviously there's a lot of men involved in the game that can teach all of us a lot. And I, there's a, I think it's, it's hard to sort of say that one would be better than the other. I think the quality of the coach is probably the very most important thing. Um, and then I think the more we can get good quality female coaches out there coaching, the better we're going to be. And I, I think that that's gonna, it's gonna take some time just um, to grow the numbers. And it takes work, you know, on everybody's part on the mentoring end and then on the, the coaches end, you know, to learn the game. So I think this is a great time to wrap it up. I have my final question I ask every guest. Okay. What do you hope people remember about your impact to soccer and the world? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I hope that people remember about my impact to soccer. Uh, just that I loved the game, right? I loved the game and I want it to be accessible to anyone who wants to uh, try to play. Um, 
and then to the world. I guess, I guess basically that as long as you're willing to put one foot in front of the other and keep working and trying, you can make a, a good contribution. Even if you don't always feel like you're um, ready for whatever challenge you're in the midst of. I always enjoy learning and talking about the women's game. I was never around for when the women's game was smaller and I enjoy learning about how the gr how it's grown over the years. And right now it is at its top, at its top. but I'm excited, excited to see where it goes in the future. We also talk about the Wisconsin Women's Symposium. And of course I didn't make it last year. I don't remember why still, I can't figure that out. But when it happens next time, I'm very excited to hopefully join in and hopefully also meet um, some amazing new people and make amazing connections again. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And until next time, remember to keep the game beautiful. Mm -hmm.